Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ASAB Partner Webcast. My name is Maureen McInerney, Partner Marketing Specialist here at ASAB, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for this presentation. Today's webcast is being recorded. The link to the recording and the accompanying slides will be posted to the ASAB website calendar of events, and all registrants will receive a follow-up email with the link to those materials once the webcast has concluded. I'd like to remind our audience members that you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation by clicking the purple Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today's webcast is Ask a Fixer, Deep Dive into the Universal Journal, sponsored by ERP Fixers. Our speakers today are Paul Overgel and Whitney Ball from ERP Fixers. And with that, I'll hand it over to Whitney to get us started today. Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, thank you to ASUG for our continued partnership in this highly popular Ask a Fixer webcast series. Uh, we're grateful that ERP Fixers and ASUG have a mutual mission of sharing knowledge amongst the SAP users. Um, ERP Fixers strives to connect SAP users with SAP experts to obtain quality and timely solutions to your SAP system issues. The ERP Fixers platform consists of thousands of consulting experts in all SAP modules ready to help and assist with their knowledge in SAP. And this goes from one question needs of yours to much larger projects. It's really um, very much client-led in terms of what you need. The ERP Fixers offerings include current, um, and they're ever-expanding, um, online platform, material ledger, S4 HANA transitional roadmap, cost transparency reports, and optimization assessments. If you have not attended a previous webcast on the optimization assessments, you can find out more at erpfixers.com. But these are short-term strategic best practice processes that we offer with the goal of giving you a more thorough understanding of your current SAP system processes. And the main goal of this is to reduce pain points and increase the system efficiencies of, your, of what you currently have. Um, these are pretty short-term from two to eight weeks and generally pitched at the higher strategic le leadership level. Don't forget that all ASUG members have immediate access to the ERP Fixers platform through the ASUG website. Here you can post a request to find that on-demand SAP expertise without a contact commitment and for as much, again, or as little assistance as you require. So finally, Without further ado, we are delighted to welcome back Paul Ovigel, founder and CEO of ERP Fixers, to present today. Paul has more than two decades of SAP financials consulting ex experience, as well as UK degrees in accounting and business management. Paul Ovigel has worked across a wide spectrum of industries in North, in North America and Europe, including in consumer goods, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, apparel, and entertainment, to name a few. Paul is a skilled consultant, author, trainer, and speaker who delivers numerous training sessions each year to professionals at both the functional and managerial levels. Paul also presents at industry conferences throughout the year, including at the annual controlling conference held in the fall in San Diego. Paul's personal mission after years spent analyzing how to reduce end user frustrations in the SAP space, and this is also the ethos behind his founding of ERP Fixers, is to help SAP customers gain knowledge and skills transfer, as well as increase their system efficiencies, and to do so on their terms. He's passionate in his drive to make ERP software work for the customer and not the other way around. Please join me in welcoming Paul Ovigel as he takes us on a deep dive into the Universal Journal. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Whitney. And thanks, Maureen. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webcast. Um, so I'm going to take you through about maybe 40 slides. Some of them are pretty quick. Some of them are more in-depth, but on the Universal Journal. The topics we'll cover are how does the Universal Journal replace previous FICO reporting, what reporting options do you have with the Universal Journal in the table ACDOC A, what are the new functionalities of S4 HANA that can be viewed in the Universal Journal, and what are the multidimensional capabilities of the Universal Journal. 
So before we start, let me, um, we're going to have a, a poll just to see how many people, um, what, what position you are in your Espo HANA or Universal Journal journey before I start. Um, so could you on this slide please select which option relates to your situation? Are you on Espo HANA and utilizing Universal Journal for reporting? Or you're on Espo HANA but do not utilize the Universal Journal? So maybe you don't know about it or it's just not on your radar. Maybe you're not on Espo HANA but plan to be in the next couple of years. So you're planning a transitional uh, path to Espo. Or you're not on Espo HANA and have no plan. Um, I think that's, that this poll is actually useful for me to, to structure the rest of this presentation. So please, for the next um, 20 seconds, I will wait for you to select your options. Then I'll go to the next slide to reveal the results. Okay. All right, so we have majority, a huge majority of people are not on S4, but plan to be within the next couple of years. And I think second is on S4 HANA, but do not utilize Universal Journal for reporting, which is interesting because it is there. So it's pri I'm, I'm pretty sure this is, that means you don't realize you're utilizing it. Um, and then there's a few 10% that actually are not on your Espo HANA and do not plan to be within the next couple of years. I think if you don't know, um, SAP says, I think 2025, I believe, is the, is the deadline for transitioning to Espo HANA. Okay, so how does the Universal Journal replace previous FIC or reporting? And before I start that, th this part of the um, webcast, let's just, I always like to define things because over the years working with SAP and working with customers, some of the SAP terminology does not actually reflect what the functionality does. And I have to say, the same thing applies to Universal Journal because when I first heard that term, it didn't sound like what it actually does, right? And maybe it's just me, but when I hear the term Universal Journal, I think of journal as a manual journal entry that's done at the end of the month or done to correct stuff. Right? Universal sounds big, but journal sounds specific to something. You know, obviously I'm not part of the um, functionality naming um, uh, department of SAP, but I might have called it something different, like universal repository or universal ledger, you know, because that's what it is. It's a repository of data, right? That's what the universal journal is. And when we get into some of the detail, I think you'll find that out. So the first slide is on this, and I apologize to some of you who have seen this slide several times. This is a pretty, pretty commonly um, used depiction of what is going on, but I think it's pretty good. It pretty well explains all the modules that feed into the Universal Journal. And it, uh, it also um, tells you the, the scope of this, this, this huge table. So as you can see on the left part of the slide, um, you have the general ledger, you have profitability analysis, you have management accounting, which is the CO module, you have asset accounting and material ledger, all feeding into Universal Journal. What does that mean? Those modules, the fields in those modules now exist in this huge table so that means it takes the best of all worlds, general ledger, market segment from COPA, costing information, coding block, which means you can actually add your own field. So it's one table with all this detail. And it's one, another key aspect of this is because the Universal Journal is an Espo HANA, and Espo HANA is this in-memory database, it also means the same table that you use for transactional data processing is also used for reporting. And that is something, again, I, I don't really know who's, I mean, you know, for the attendees of this webcast, whether you're more technically inclined or more user-oriented, I'm hoping it's a mix of both. 
but that might not even matter to you, right? You might not even know what the difference between a table for transactional data and a table for reporting is. But just to give a little insight into that, the SAP system that's, that your problem, most of you are using right now, when you, um, when you extract data for reporting, that data is coming from a summarized table of the real table, which is where the transactional processing takes place. So basically, if you post a, a journal entry, it goes to a transactional data table. When you extract a report from of that journal entry, it comes from a more summarized table because it can't keep going to that same transactional data table because of several things that I'm not even totally clued in on because I'm not that technical. But this actually eliminates that um, um, separation of transactional versus reporting. And what does that mean for an end user? It just makes the data quicker to access. It just gives more options. Okay, data being stored only once. This is important for particular financial pe people that are using different reports that don't necessarily reconcile. The Universal Journal does that. Um, reduction of memory footprint. Again, this is more of a uh, technical thing, but it just means you don't have to replicate data in different tables. And then fast multi-dimensional reporting. I'm hoping to show some of that in the next, uh, at some point in this presentation. Right, the merging of FICO is, is for me, just for my personal journey in SAP is, is huge because you know, I started in the late 90s, and then FI, I started as an accountant. To me, everything was FI. You know, CO was just this, you know, CO to me was a tangential part of FI. But when I was introduced to SAP, CO was a huge um, 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 segment, which was on par with FI, and a lot of stuff took place there, and the, you know, which was great, but then it, it had its own challenges. So merging the two together and getting the best of both worlds I think is, is a huge um, it's a huge deal. So looking at the financial architecture in S4 HANA, so if we look at the left part of the screen, we see these five modules. And for now, if you just think about, okay, what exactly is being integrated into the Universal Journal? Think of these five different modules. You see them in a few slides. Asset accounting, material ledger, general ledger accounting, controlling, and COPA, right? Those five modules. In fact, um, those five modules almost existed separately in separate tables, and you needed reconciliation for almost each of them, but now they're in one table. So in asset accounting, for example, the asset accounting totals table didn't include GL account and profit center, same with the material ledger total table. The CO tables, you had different levels of detail because sometimes FI couldn't go down to the nth degree while CO could. Profitability analysis, for those of you who use it, I probably don't need to mention the pain points of reconciliation, the pain points of different triggers of what hit FI versus what hit COPA. So in ECC, the whole thing of multiple sources of truth, I, I'll actually touch on that multiple sources of truth because it's a little unfair to say ECC was strictly multiple sources of truth. It, it was actually, all this stuff was still somewhat integrated. In fact, that, that was the whole point of an ERP system, is this stuff is integrated, right? So from a user standpoint, it does look integrated, but behind the scenes, it was still, you still had disparate tables, right? So multiple sources of truth is really more from the standpoint of where that data was coming from. But from a user perspective, you know, some of you listening to this might even say, but wait a minute, you know, when I, when I display an asset report, I can easily go to the general ledger. If I, I can jump from FI to CO easily or COPA to FI. So there was on the front end some integration, but that was really based on these extra things that needed to happen, these extra views or these extra tables. It wasn't integrated in the source table, right? So reconciliation between the modules was somewhat difficult. And if you used BI, you needed multiple extractors which were attached to different tables. Um, in, in S4, as we said before, the, the idea is to move further towards a single source of truth. Again, I wouldn't necessarily say we're now introducing a single source of truth. I don't think that's accurate because in 1997 when I started, and when we were talking to customers about SAP, we were talking about a single source of truth and how SAP satisfies that. So I think this is really more just on a, on a, 
uh, scale, we're moving towards a single source, source of truth, not just in the front end, but in the back end as well. Okay. Then real-time reporting is possible across all dimensions without BI. In fact, I actually, I, I wonder how, you know, this is just, again, another personal take on this. I wonder how, how important BI is after all this integration, after the, 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 the memory footprint is reduced, you have everything integrated. It makes BI less significant than it has been over the past 10, 20 years. And sorry to any BI folks whose whole career has relied on that, but that's just my opinion. Um, so, with S4 HANA, you, you see that um, the Universal Journal, on top of it, just helps with better integration. That, that's a very key part of all this. So now, this, when we talk of tables, and again, this, this might not be something that certain people are totally interested in. Well, maybe some people haven't heard of some of these tables, but two major tables in SAP FI was BKPF and BSEG, right? BKPF is the head of BSEG was the line item. Those two tables still exist, right? In fact, when we talk of the Universal Journal, we're not saying that Universal Journal is replacing the line item detail in BSEG. Universal Journal is actually replacing the total of tables, all those summarized tables that we're talking about. Universal Journal puts all of them together. So you still have BKPF and BSEG, but the ACDOC A table, so ACDOC A is basically synonymous with the Universal Journal. Um, that is where all the, all the good stuff happens, right? So the combination of BKPF and ACDOC A will give you everything you can get in the FI module, as well as these other upstream modules like um, Material Ledger, um, Asset Accounting, CO, and all the rest. The line item tables contain all the data fields needed for the V modules. The line item table at K also stores information for multiple gap reporting. So if you have the new GL and you were using IF IFRS and U.S. gap accounting principles, those are now absorbed into the Universal Journal. The data structures are simplified and you can add your own fields to them. So I think the, you know, the takeaway from this, this slide is, you know, the Universal Journal is, it's a table, right? If you want one word that encapsulates it, it's a table. But it's a very, very big table. That's it. Um, I've spoken to a lot of customers over the last couple of years since this came out. And I have, you know, some good, you know, people say some good things. People say some skeptical things. One skeptical thing is, why should I care about a big table? You know, BSEG was a big table. You know, <laughs> we, we didn't get all, this, all excited about it. You know, is the integration of this table to other modules that's really big. BSEG was more isolated. AgDoc is more encompassing. Right. So, so from a database standpoint, um, we talked about, you know, the improvements, the reduced data footprint because of the direct access extract from the database, right? So like I said, there's no intermediary tables that your information is accessing before you get to the Universal Journal. You, it goes directly. You might know, you might not even realize that as a user, just like as a user, you don't realize it today. You know, you don't know what table, if you're extracting a report, you know, in your head, you're not saying, oh yeah, okay, this is going from um, my, my, my mouse or whatever to this, this table and it's actually, you don't care about that. But what you would see as a difference is the amount of time it takes to extract these reports and the amount of data manipulation. You can do manipulation in a good way. You can do to, to you know, resort your data without any runtime issues or without any lags or things like that. That's what this data footprint and all this data streamlining does. You can add your own custom dimensions. I think you'll find even, even that specific requirement, you'll find that it's, um, with all the fields in the Universal Journal, including COPA, you might even find you don't need custom fields, but it's there if you need it. Compatibility views, you know, because when SAP comes out with new things, they always try to, you know, you know, give you more, but keep what you have. So compatibility views allow you to have the old tables that we're now seeing are replaced by the Universal Journal still allows you to access them just in case you had some custom programs or custom reports that were reading those tables, right? So now if you think about it, you've got the Universal Journal, which is a big table, which encompasses, encompasses all these previous tables, but you can actually carve out 
fields in the Universal Journal that replicate those tables, right? So if you go to table COEP or COSP or, or some other tables that were previously total tables no longer needed, they're actually now not aggregating um, whatever or, um, originating tables that they came from. They're aggregating the Universal Journal, right? But from a user standpoint, it looks like, hey, it's just exactly the same thing. But that's only it was only a compromise to make sure that while people transition to Universal Journal, you know, you don't get stuck because you had something based on a different table to add Doc A. Less memory consumption is something else I talked about, and no more totals and aggregates. So again, for those who don't know, totals and aggregates are just intermediary tables that help extraction of data easier without going directly to the database where the transactional processing was done. So here's a, a slide on table integration. And I, you know, just for those who are tired of hearing about tables, this is probably one of the last slides I'll show on this. I actually don't even have all the tables that are feeding into Act Doc 8. But even just with this diagram, you can see how many tables were their own tables feeding into just one table. All right, from Material Ledger, um, and let me, I'll just touch on Material Ledger for a second. It's not all the Material Ledger tables that go into AgDoc A, right? It's some of them. It, it's some of the major Material Ledger um, uh, tables that have to do with material valuation that go in there. I didn't even add material management tables, some MM tables like MView and EView. Those are material valuation tables. Those also go in. I don't have that on this, this slide. But for material ledger, you have most of the major tables for material valuation there. And then from the general ledger, you have both the totals table, GLT0, DSIS, and then you have the new GL tables as well going in there. From COPA, you have the profitability segment table, CE4, and your operating concern going in there. The asset accounting totals tables are in there, as well as the um, overhead controlling tables for cost centers, orders, and all the rest going in there. So like I said, this is probably the last time you'll see a depiction of a table we have. So we'll now get into more um, reporting options and things like that that you can get from the Universal Journal. Because the advantage for someone like me who's been doing SAP consulting for, for, for years and talking to other consultants in the FIC of space, oh, this is really great, you know. All the pain that customers are feeling, you now know that it's gonna be fixed because of this universal journal. But the truth is, from a user standpoint, um, I, can, I can see a, a typical finance user going to a presentation on universal journal S4 HANA and saying, okay, so what? So what if, you know, we have this big table, you know? So what you wanna know is what does it do, you know? what. How does that impact your day-to-day -day usage of the system, right? Um, you might not even care about the word act, okay? Just like you probably don't care about a, um, um, BSEC or, or one of the other tables. But what does it mean? So it, it means you can you have much more data to play with. You have better integration, and your reporting is going to be streamlined and easier to navigate. It comes down to it. The, the Universal Journal really comes down to reporting. That, that's what it comes down to, right? Reporting and analysis, right? And just another note on this. Even as I speak, the, all the capabilities of the Universal Journal keep changing, right? They keep adding things, right? Because it just provides, because of the speed of HANA and this huge table, it provides so many options, right, to improve the FICO um, module, so many options. And I'll talk about some of them, some of the, the, the ones that have been around in the previous HANA releases, some of the new ones, and also show a report at the end of this, um, actually show it on the slide to see what the capabilities are. But really it comes down to reporting. So this is the, the table, how it looks in, in SAP, right? The ACT -OK table. I just showed a section of it. Actually, I pulled in a section that had you know, like the ledger, the document number, the company code, as well as the document type, and even some COPA characteristics as well, just to show out it, it's all in one. And then what are the reporting capabilities? So just in a snapshot, 
Um, and some of this stuff you probably wouldn't even hear on your normal um, universal journal when you, 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 people normally talk about it. Even KE30, for those who are in um, who use COPA, this is a report you can create within the SAP system. You can even have your K30 report on account-based COP, which reads the Universal Journal. Okay, that's not that's not really mentioned that much because I think the whole idea is to steer um, um, SAP uh, users away from uh, these internal reports and take them to Fiori or, or somewhere else. But even that accesses the Universal Journal. Creating ABAP reports with all these fields or a combination of these fields. We mentioned BW before, one BW extractor instead of many, which we can combine all this data. SAP brought out our core data services view, CDS view, which is a, a different way to do data modeling um, yeah, and show the results in a spreadsheet or some other, or, or some other fashion. Right, so, so this big repository allows all these different types of reporting output to be created on it. Also, from a COPA standpoint, you have line item extension, PL line item extension by adding different fields to COPA. The COPA, you could obviously have characteristics um, which allow you to report in fields like customer, um, product, plant, all the rest. You can also add your own characteristics. When you're migrating to, to S4, there is a program you should run to make sure your custom characteristics can be populated in the Universal Journal. Um, you can also add extra fields which are not COPA fields using coding block accessibility, which also existed in, um, in exists right now in ERP. But in the Universal Journal, you can do that as well as with um, COPA fields as well. Um, so with COPA, just I'll make a comment about that before moving on. Uh, it's account-based field. If you haven't heard already, you know, if you have COPA, um, you probably and you probably use costume-based. In the Universal Journal, it's account-based COPA. In fact, what, what I'm hearing is they don't even want to call it account-based COPA because it does so much more, but it's based on the account-based COPA logic, right? So you get all your COPA data, but you get it by GL account. You don't get it by these value fields, which sometimes don't reconcile. Then Fiori reporting, I think a good way, so like I said, all this stuff is about reporting, which I said in a couple of slides ago you can do within the ECC system, but I think a really slick way of reporting and getting the best out of what Universal Journal ha has right now, I think Fiori is, is, is just a better user interface, um, and it, it's able to accommodate all the data, because this, Having more data is a double-edged sword. It's good because, okay, now I have more options, but it could get pretty overwhelming, right? It could get overwhelming to the system itself, but more importantly, it could get overwhelming because, okay, how do I sort this data? We have all this stuff in one table. It's not partitioned like it was before, which helps with reconciliation, but it, it could also make things pretty overwhelming to, to, to explain, to, to decipher, and just to analyze. So I think Fiori, the, the tiles in Fiori, which relate to different um, uh, different functionalities, different purposes, are pretty pretty good. And I'll show one of them at the end of this webcast. Another new functionality is semantic tagging. Again, this is something relating to reporting, right? So we, we have the, the, the we have this huge table, Universal Journal. We have better reports, better reporting options. Now there's also functionality to allow the integration of certain um, certain dimensions in one structure to be used in other structures. So specifically, what is semantic tag, right? So if you have someone like a financial statement version with all your different levels, which represents your different uh, general ledger accounts, you can tag different, you can have tags for different GL accounts to assign them to specific types of function, whether it's cost of goods sold, it's revenue, and stuff like that. Those tags themselves are objects on their own. I don't know if they call them objects right now, but that's kind of what they are. Once you've tagged them, those tags can be used in other reports, in KPI reports. You don't have to recreate 
these groups in other reports. You know, if you say something is revenue or it's comms or something else, it keeps that same label in reports like cash flow and project profit profitability in KPIs and other reports. So semantic tagging is a new, it's a relatively new, I think it was 1709 or 1610 it came out, and it just allows more flexible reporting by, by you know, allowing you to, to retain the, the, the label that's on an account if you want to report it using different things. Again, this is only capable if all the data is in the same place. That brings me back to my comments about it's the, it's the options that the Universal Journal offers that really is, is what is exciting about it. Another type of um, um, tagging um, can be done on objects like um, cost centers and profit centers to make them also flexible when it comes to creating hierarchy for these objects. So for example, if you have a profit center, in the profit center master data, there's de different fields in the profit center master data which identify what's the company code of the profit center or what's the segment of the profit center or what's something else in the profit center that identifies what it is. Now, all these different fields, you can actually put tags on these fields to at least the hierarchical tags. You could say, I want the company code to be the highest level in the node, the highest level node for this master data, and I want the segment to be lower than that and something else to be even be lower than that. These are just basically fields that you're sequencing so that if you're reporting, instead of saying, if I want to report on, um, if I want to do a hierarchy on, on my profit centers, instead of adding your profit centers, to each of the hierarchies, you can just use the tags within the hierarchy to designate which profit centers roll into it. So flexible hierarchies, again, I think it's, it's, I don't know how many companies use it right now, but it is something that I think will grow because it saves time on changing and, and um, um, recreating groups for reporting if the, the, um, the object already has these tags on the master data. All you're doing is reporting by the tag, and the object just flows under it. It's very similar to something, for, for those who know what's called uh, um, uh, summarization hierarchies, it's very similar to that, where you can actually uh, uh, label your field in a certain hierarchy and report on it. So that's flexible hierarchies. The next is you also have global accounting hierarchies, which is basically a central repository where you can manage all these hierarchies and keep them consistent and uniform as opposed to, as opposed to having different areas where you, where you do this maintenance. So again, these, those three types of hierarchies and tagging are just also available just because you have all this data in the same place. So what are the new functionalities of s that can be viewed in the Universal Journal? Let's look at a few of them. We've talked about multi-dimensional general ledger. We'll talk about parallel ledger in a minute. We'll talk about user-defined field. Extension of simulation ledger we're going to talk about. This 999999 line items, that's been an issue ever since I started SAP, probably before that. Um, and that is because uh, a posting to FI only has, you can only post 9999 lines, and that's because the line item field only has three characters. So, you know, you have one to 9999. After that, you get a, an error. You have to either carve out the documents or something like that. With um, at doc A, the, the, the number of lines has extended to 999999. So you have much more room for po loading or processing data that's more than 1,000 lines. Great functionality. One thing I'll warn about that, which these are the kind of things that, you know, sometimes if you don't read between the lines, you wouldn't know what, what exactly is taking place there. Although ACT.K is 999999, BSEG, which still exists, is still just 999. Right? So um, ACT.K is fine, BSEG is still there. So you could, if, if, if you don't summarize on BSEG, you could still run into the same issue, right? But the ACT.K table does have the functionality that expands those line item numbers. Um, you have eight 
additional freely defined currencies, which I'll go into later. And then you have parallel valuation integration, which is also very, very good functionality, which I'll talk about later. And then you have a soft close, soft close meaning you don't have to wait till the end of the month before you can analyze your data or see what's going on in, in your reports. Uh, this screen here is on transaction FI. It's a new transaction came out with um, as for FINSC underscore ledger. I think it's one of the key configuration transactions for the Universal Journal because it combines a lot of the different major fields in the Universal Journal. It puts them all together. For example, this is where the ledger is defined. The ledger is a key field, right, which could be the, the main ledger, the leading ledger, or a parallel ledger. It also, um, this is where you also define the valuation views that are assigned to the ledger. Is it legal, is it group, is it profit center? This is also where you define the currency types, which I'll show in a minute. But FINSC underscore ledger is one of the key differences with, between the way things are set up in, in S4 for the Universal Journal and in ERP. So now in, in ERP, you have three extra currencies. In S4, you have um, it, it's probably well, 11 now. You have eight extra ones. Again, I don't know if you know companies would need to use all eight, but there's the flexibility to do so. In, in ERP, you have three local currencies, two currencies in CEO, and three currencies in Material Ledger. In uh, Universal Journal, you have eight extra currencies. And when I say eight extra currencies, I don't mean eight extra transactional currencies. I mean eight extra local currencies, eight extra currencies you can use to translate anything that it hits your company code. Right? Each currency has its own field name in ACT.K. Um, and they're freely defined. You don't have to, they don't have to depend on what's in the lead and ledger. Very simple to create them and then to add them to the, um, to the company code, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, just one warning here. If you have material ledger, material ledger still only uses just three currencies. So FI uses eight, material ledger for now uses three. I'm sure that will expand soon. Meaning that when you, if you use Material Ledger and you set Material Ledger up, in S4, you have to you have explicitly specify which currencies in FI you want to use. It's no longer automatic. You have to explicitly, explicitly specify, otherwise the system doesn't know which of these eight or 11 currencies do you want to use. So this same transaction, FINC, SC underscore ledger, also is where you assign the company code to the different currencies. So if you look at this screen, you see company code 1710. It has the local currency and the global currency, which are standard. Local currency is basically the company, currency of the company code itself. Global currency is normally tied to the currency of the controlling area. In this case, that's also the group currency, the controlling area currency. And then you have eight fields that you can do what you, you can put whatever you want in the, whatever currency check you have created in there. And another thing with these, um, because this looks like the transaction OB22 that's in the ERP system, but in OB22, when you have extra currencies, they have to have a specific number. Like if it's group currency, it's 30. If it's group currency, group valuation, 31. The specific digits that are used for the currency type and the valuation view. But when you, when you define your own currency, you can put whatever you want. You can put letters if you want. Right? You can put whatever you want there. Just bear in mind, like I said, this, is, this, this currency type only relates to FI. They don't relate to material ledger. The material ledger can only take three of these. Um, another thing, I don't have a screenshot about this, but your accounting principles as well need to be assigned. This is where you assign everything. Accounting principles, ledger, currency type, company code valuation, you all take place in this FINSC underscore ledger. All right, so when it comes to ledgers of multiple valuation views, for those who either use it or, or and want to know how it works in S4 or don't use it and want to know how it works, um, a valuation view is just basically a different way of valuing 
particularly your inventory, but it could also be your um, your cogs. But in S4 and in the Universal Journal, you can choose to have what's called single valuation ledger or multiple valuation ledger. And I'll quickly explain what they are. I'll start with multiple valuation because that's how ERP is. So in ERP, you have one ledger, maybe 0L. That's your main ledger. And that ledger, you can have group valuation, profit center valuation, legal valuation, all three valuations in one ledger. That's the norm. In S4, you can map each ledger to a valuation view. You could say, I want my leading ledger to only be legal valuation. I want my other ledger to only be group valuation. I want my third ledger to only be profit set. You can make it very specific, right? Which has two advantages and disadvantages, right? Advantage obviously is more streamlined and more is cleaner, right? Because every time you look in a certain ledger, you know you're getting a certain type of valuation. The disadvantage is that if you now have your valuations in each ledger, your month end processes will have to take place multiple times, depending on what ledger, because as you know, when you're doing something at month end and you have a parallel ledger, certain transactions are ledger based, so you have to do one at a time. So um, single and multi valuation, a single valuation ledger is a new thing in the Universal Journal with S4 HANA, and it's something, again, it's your choice if you want to use it or not. Um, how, in fact, I'll, I'll stay on this slide and just talk about valuations. This multiple valuation view, I would say maybe 30%, 30 to 40% of SAP customers use it. That's all. Because you need material ledger in order to use it. But um, you, right now, there's no transition for to go in s from not having valuation to having valuation. So if you're interested in value, multiple valuations, we can get you like group valuation, transfer pricing, profit center valuation, which is you know transferring just within plans, between plans and having a markup and all that stuff. Um, if you want that, then you would have to um, convert, activate those valuations before you move to S4 and not after. Um, the new ledger type in S4 HANA Okay, let's talk about a few of these ledgers. They created different ledgers, different types of ledger. One is called the extension ledger. You know, extension ledger can be used for various purposes, right? There's an extended extension ledger. What, what does that mean? With an extension ledger, it's almost like a little uh, uh, a ledger that piggybacks on top of your main ledger, right? You have a main ledger, right? Maybe it has you have a thousand dollars in the account in the main ledger. In your extension ledger, you could say, I want in this account to add, maybe for uh, it, it could be for a, a local reporting requirement or some other purpose, I, I want an adjustment of $20 because of some valuation on top of my, 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 my main ledger. In SAP, what you do is just post to that extension ledger, and when you report on the extension ledger, it adds the main ledger to the extension ledger. So it's almost a way of doing gap adjustments without having to replicate the whole main ledger in the extension ledger, okay? So in parallel ledger, what would happen, I'll use the same example, in parallel ledger, if I had a leading ledger and I post $1,000 to the leading ledger, if I use parallel ledger, when I post that $1,000, that $1,000 also goes to the parallel ledger, right? And then I can make adjustments in the parallel ledger. Extension ledger, when I post $1,000, it only goes to the leading ledger. If I post 20 extra dollars to the extension ledger, it, it only goes to the extension ledger, but if I report on the extension ledger, it gives me the leading ledger and the extension ledger. In configuration, you specify for each extension ledger which leading ledger do you want to piggyback off. Okay, so that's called the standard extension ledger. There's a simulation extension ledger, which is for foreign currency valuation. It means you can run your foreign currency valuation, I think it's FAGL is called CV or something, or change the transaction in HANA. But when you, when you run that transaction, you can do it before month then just to say, what will my foreign currency valuation be? And that's a simulation extension ledger. Now, more recently, they brought out a predictive extension ledger, which is like a statistical ledger, right? You, all those, because you now have account-based COPA, no longer costing-based COPA, although not in the Universal Journal, um, account-based COPA did not initially have statistical um, uh, amounts. But with a predictive extension ledger, you can actually have a statistical 
condition records flow into these predictive extension ledgers and not affect your main ledger. Okay. Um, there's there's more more um, uh, information about this on this slide. Like it, the whole point of extension ledgers, it, it reduces the data footprint. Otherwise, you'd use parallel ledger, right? So one main thing is that instead of replicating data in a, a parallel ledger, extension ledger it reduces the amount of data that goes into the system, and also ex, uh, extension ledger can be statistical, right? It may not be something you want that's really going to be for reporting. Um, in your financial statement, it's really just a one if. Um, the next two slides are on things that were limitations in um, account based COP and ERP, but which are cost of goods sold splitting. So, uh, right now in ERP, unless you use cost and based COP, your cost of goods sold in one account. In, in S4 and the universal draw, you can split that by, by configuring um, um, something called a splitting schema you can split that cost of goods sold into the cost components that make up that cost. Um, then also the same thing with variance categories. In your GL right now, your variance is on one account. In ERP, in, in S4, you can split your GL as well into various production, um, produ into your production variance account in the GL. You can have multiple accounts in the GL. In both cases, um, the original account Still get close to you. So you still have an original COGS account, original production variance account. Those accounts get debited and then they get credited and then posted to all these extra accounts. All right, real time profitability that's another one which is when we talk about soft close, soft close is a term they use to say, hey, you know, it's not what you do necessarily what you do at the end of the month, it gives you an idea of what's going to happen at the end of the month. Right. You can run some of these transactions or some of these transactions that populate automatically. A cool one is profitability segment, right? So normally if you have, typically example, if you have an internal order or a WBS element, which is revenue-based, right? When you post to that WBS element, even though it has all the characteristics like customer and product and all, and all that stuff, it's only until month end or a specific periodic standpoint that you settle it to um, COPX. Well, real-time profitability, based on a very slick uh, uh, derivation process, just by posting to that WBS element, you can get a simulated view of all those characteristics in the Universal Journal. It's actually tagged with a field name that says, hey, this is not the real thing. This is the simulation in real time. But you can actually get a real-time profitability before you settle. Hey, when you settle, it, 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 it goes to the real um, object, but before that, you can get um, real-time profitability. Self-close is something that is going to continue. I mean, this is where I think SAP is heading, so you don't have to wait till month end. You can, you can get a glimpse of certain data before you close. So what are the multi-dimensional capabilities of Universal Journal? Okay, it, this is where I think you start now getting bang for your buck with, okay, what's all this stuff? What, what do I get with all of these? I'm going to use an example of just one report. There's one report in Fiori. I mean, Fiori has several reports. But the trial balance report, for example, can be used, can replicate about 10 different reports that were used in ECC. I actually had a slide where I had, I was trying to map all those 10 different reports to just to depict how much it does but it just got too cluttered, so I removed it. So just take my word for it, the trial balance, and I'll show some of it um, in the next few slides. It combines some, because now you, it's based on the universal draw, which combines FI, CO, COP, and material ledger, asset accounting. A lot of reports in those modules can come from just one report here, just depending on the way you slice and dice the data. Um, so that's what I'm saying here. It splits the balances based on cost and a profit in a segment, functional area, business area, and so on. Um, you can just choose what you want to navigate with. You can display hierarchies. We talked about some of those hierarchies um, in, uh, earlier in this, in this presentation. You can compare one year to the other, one month to the other, like you could do with other ERP trial balance reports. You can use filters and, and several more things. You can also, uh, as most accountants ignore everything, they only concentrate on the last point, which is you can export the results to Excel, and you can do that too. Okay, so with the Fiori tile selection, when you have access to Fiori, which is obviously based, and the good thing about Fiori is 
it's not like BW where you're going to have to wait overnight and then you get your reporting. Whatever is in your system is available in Fiori. It's just a different user interface. So if you click on the reporting um, tab, the standard reporting tab, you can actually create your own tile, but you click, click on the standard reporting tab and click on trial balance. I'm going to rush through this. I, I'm seeing that we are actually coming close to the, the end of this, but next four minutes, I'll, I'll just run through some of what you can do here. The selection parameters screen, you can enter um, just like you have in the normal selection screen. You can enter your ledger, your company code, uh, posting date from and to. One thing to note here, like look at ledger and company code. It, it looks like it's just one field it takes, but when you drop down on those, those fields, it's a selection box. So even though I have just 17 and 10 company code, if I add to 17 10, 11, 12, 13, it all shows up there, or even a range of them. Um, then also you have a selection bar for filters. Like in this example, I have a, when I drop down on profit center, it tells me, do I want to, um, uh, when I click on the filter bu button, do, do I want to filter on profit center? If I click on that and, and, and click on go, it, on the left hand side of the screen, it shows me the profit center field, which you can filter all this information of the GL account and the amounts on. Then in Fiori, in this report, there's two major, um, um, uh, I would call it summarization fields. One is called measures and one is called dimensions. Measures is basically what you, maybe you would call key figures. Those are the amount columns. So if you see the amount here called uh, company code currency or ending balance in company code currency, those are the measures. When you click on the left-hand side, what's called measures, you can see all the different amount columns you can put in there, and there are several of them um, on the left. When you, so once you just click on that field and say add me measure to display, then you'll see that that measure, like starting balance and company code in, in the currency, it, it shows up as a column there. Um, now, I said the next, we talked about measures, attributes. Now, these are the fields that you can report on. Right. So the field, so think of measures, and in, in, for those who use COP, think of measures as value fields, think of attributes as characteristics. So you click on the, the attributes or, or dimensions um, field, like profit center, it adds profit center to the call. At the bottom of the screen, the middle part of the screen where you see the word rows, um, you can sort those characteristics depending on which is the one with the highest priority to the least priority so that you will, in this case, I'm subtotaling on company code first, and GL, then profit center. The sequence of sorted columns, um, the sequence of what you see in the rows field highlighted is, what, is how the columns will be sorted. So you have other options. I'm going to really rush through this now because I think we're running out of time. I'm going to rush through um, the other options. Like you can jump from, if I click on the profit center column, click on jump to, I can go directly to the profit center master. All right. Um, I can define conditions for what I want to display. I can click on um, the define conditions uh, box, and that shows me, do I want to display the starting balance in this certain number, or do I want to say greater than, less than, all that stuff is available. You can jump from to detailed views. If I look at a, a particular amount and I click on it and say jump to, I can say, okay, for this general ledger account, show me the general ledger balance. And that takes me to another screen, just like your FS10N screen, where you can see the balance of the general ledger or the line items. Um, with the chart button, you can click on that and display the, display the chart, um, uh, either a chart or a table, depending on, or even a combination of chart and table, depending on the settings, and you can um, change those settings. I think I missed um, in the previous screen, I talked about Excel, at the bottom of the screen, of the Fiori report, that little that little tag, if you click on that, that's where you can export it to Excel or save it or, or as a PDF or file. Um, you can also jump to the comparison report where you click on jump to as well and click on trial balance comparison and display what you want, what you're from and to are. Um, I'll, I'll close with that. I mean, there's just one more slide which shows, you know, the trial balance comparison after you've done that. But this was just a little taste of just one report, trial balance, right, which has all the fields. As you see on the left-hand side where you see dimensions, all the fields are in all these 
modules, asset accounting, material ledger, all the rest, available in one report, which could combine a lot of different things. So hopefully that's just a taster into um, the uh, what I think is the strength, is the real strength of the Universal Journal, is this type of the options you have for, um, for reporting and the different dimensions and combining data from different modules. I'm going to hand over to Maureen um, for some questions. And just a note on the questions, um, as for anyone who's attended our webcast, if we can't get through all the questions, we, we guarantee that every single question that's asked or, or written, we're going to answer it and we will we'll have it posted on our website. So I'll hand back to Maureen. Thanks, Paul. Um, as you mentioned, we um, are moving on, and you can submit your questions using that purple Q&A button, but we do have quite a few in there, so I'll get right to it for as long as we can. Uh, the first question, can we do substitution rules for GL accounts from secondary to primary in S4-1709? Paul, you still there? Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I started talking already. So um, I didn't mention that there is the secondary cost elements are actually general ledger accounts in um, in S4. So the, the 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 that question was asked, I believe, based on a previous functionality of SAP which allowed you to do real-time integration. So if you posted to a secondary cost element, the real-time integration allows you to post to a primary cost element in the background if the secondary cost element crosses over functional error or company code or something like that. However, that functionality is gone, is, is, goes away. You don't need to have a primary cost element um, replicating the secondary cost element because the secondary cost element is the GL account. Right? So it's a concept that's maybe a little difficult to transition to, but think of a secondary cost element in SAP, uh, in S4HANA, as a GL account with a different category. That's all. That's what it is. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Paul, can you explain why the BSEG table continues in the Universal Journal and BSIS and so on? and? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question, and I'll explain it in my terms. I'm not SAP. I'm also trying to understand this stuff myself. But BSIS, BSAS are total tables, right? Remember when I said that, um, that these total tables are intermediary tables, which are not the same tables you post to, even though you don't know it. It's in the background. These total tables, they summarize what you post to so it's available for reporting. The BSEG table is not a total table, though. The BSIS, BSAS, um, 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 all that stuff, they are total tables. BSEG is a line item table, right? So that doesn't go away. Um, the BSIS, BSAS tables, and COEP and all the others, they are replaced by AG.K, but like I said, BSEG is still, and that, that still exists. That's a line item table. And just so you know, it's not just the B set, even in, in the, some of the other modules, some of the original tables are still there. It's the totals tables that goes away. So we're, we're not, uh, ACDOC, think of ACDOC A, Universal Journal, as a huge totals table, which is as opposed to a huge table that replaces B set. B set definitely still exists in, in, in S4. Thank you. Next question. In S4 HANA, what happens to the CO data that is stored in cost objective objects in an ECC system today? What happens to results analysis data? What happens to results? Okay. So all the CO data in ECC, when you do an S4 HANA migration, you're not losing any. There's a whole bunch of steps, migration steps, that are going to pass over the data from CL um, to the Universal Journal. So there's no, um, well, in, 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 unless something seriously goes wrong, the migration is what takes your data over from CL to the Universal Journal. Now, when you're in the Universal Journal, you have, you're going to have your historical data, right? 
but you're not going to have, and the historical data actually have, I can't remember what it is, there's a certain field that, it, that indicates historical data. But the thing is, when going forward, the CO numbers are not needed anymore because they come from the same table. So going forward, actually, your, your controlling numbers are they're like statistical document numbers because the universal document number now takes charge. There's one number for FI and CO. The controlling number is like, it's like letters, like an alphanumeric number going forward. However, your historic numbers are definitely going to be um, available in, in that case. Thanks, Paul. That does look like all the time we have today for our Q&A portion, but we do have quite a few in there. So please know that Paul will follow up with you once the webcast has concluded. And with that, I'll hand it back to Paul for any final remarks before we close the webcast today. Um, just to say thank you very much. And as, as you can see, there's, I, I got to tell you, I, you know, I enjoy talking about this topic, but there's so much that one can, can um can uh, cover in just an hour. We might do another webcast on it at a future point, just because of the amount of interest in it. And I thank you very much. I hope there's. I hope this was useful. And like I said, we will answer every question that was asked and posted on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Whitney and Paul, for a great webcast. On behalf of ASUG, I'd like to thank ERP Fixers as well as everyone who took the time today to attend this webcast. I just wanted to leave you with some quick information on ASEC before we close the webcast today. ASEC helps connect SAP customers to the people and information that they need to maximize their investment in SAP. If you'd like to speak to someone about becoming a member of ASEC, please message info at ASEC.com. As mentioned before, the recording and slides from today's program will be posted to the ASEC website, and all registrants will receive a follow-up email. Please take a moment to complete the survey by clicking on the green button at the bottom of your screen. With that, I'd like to close today's webcast. Have a great day, everyone.